you think Noctis is whiny? Never play 10. <laughs> <laughs> Never play Final Fantasy. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris are joined by Eric Brody for a roundtable discussion of Final Fantasy 15. Plus, thoughts on Horizon Zero Dawn's review embargo, impressions of Fire Emblem Heroes, and more. The BackwardCompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 93 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey, everybody. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, hey. And we have a returning guest today, Eric Brody. Hello. Eric, how about you go in and uh, reintroduce yourself for those of us who haven't heard you since uh, year one it's of the podcast? It's been a while, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm Eric Brody. Uh, I am a producer, and I do a lot of like kind of marketing biz dev for Polynight Games, a local Dallas-based dev, uh, indie dev. Excellent. Uh, and today we have Eric on. Uh, we're going to be um, having him back for the next episode as well to talk a little bit more about what you do with Polly Knight and uh, as a community manager. Um, but today we're actually going to be talking about Final Fantasy XV. It's a roundtable discussion. Um, this is one that I named as my uh, personal game of the year for last year. Um, if you want to go back and listen to episode 89 to hear those thoughts, you can. Uh, but we're going we, to... now. It, it came out last year? <laughs> yes, it did. <laughs> I'm actually... Okay. Wait, what year is this? This is 2017. Okay, I was up really late actually playing Final Fantasy XV. Mm-hmm. Wait, or no, I played it this morning really early. It depends on your perspective. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I'm a little out of it episode? right now. It, <laughs> maybe. The day stops when you finally go to sleep, no matter what time that See, is. See, there you go. Yeah. There you go. That's a good way of thinking about it, yeah. <laughs> actually. Um, but yeah, so now at this point we've all played it, and uh, we're going to be going a little bit in depth about the story and the mechanics and what we liked and didn't like, so it should be a good discussion. Uh, but first we have some opening segments for you, including Table Talk. Now it's time for Table Talk. Discussions on tabletop games of all kinds. So, Chris, your working name, of course, is Kruger, as in the context of Doc and Kruger, and the Doc and Kruger cast that we sometimes do whenever Jim is sick. <laughs> and... Uh, we are very excited because we're actually bringing uh, to the table, should I say, mm-hmm. uh, the the talk of Roll With It, which is our proprietary system. It's a diceless system. Mm-hmm. And a few episodes ago, we, we actually got sort of into it and the crunchy bits of, of mm-hmm. how it worked and that sort of a thing. But this is not crunchy bits talk. This is actually a preview talk mm-hmm. because we did a season of Roll With It, after which the our WI system is named. The Roll With It system mm-hmm. is, mm-hmm. you know, it, it, it's named for the Roll With It show. It's the uh, system's maiden voyage, as it were. Yes. The, so the, fir- the first real, they, like, non-test, we're actually doing this for real yeah. uh, campaign. But what I'm really excited about here is uh, to talk a little bit about the show that we did. Um, because the challenge that we gave to our GM, who is Will Parsons, who's been on the show before, on the podcast before, um, and also our our GM for, um, what was it, the River of Time series mm-hmm. yes. that we did. Uh, so, so we brought him back and we threw the challenge at him. And the challenge was, uh, we want a cross-worlds or multi-worlds uh, scenario that's going to bring in a bunch of different types of characters into the show. And so I decided to challenge him with a historical character. So I went for Leonardo da Vinci, mm-hmm. time traveler. Um, <laughs> And then we had a was a magical girl. Mm-hmm. We had um, you know some some college guy, and then we mm-hmm. also had Jim. How would you describe your character? Uh, a rad to the max '80s action hero, right? But uh, more in the vein of like the uh, the last Starfighter type '80s hero, where it's like the arcade kid that actually or the arcade teenager. Yeah, that it was like the twenty two eighties, right? Badass. Yeah. The eighties yeah. evolution of Buck Rogers, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. everything eighties yeah. wished it was. <laughs> right. Um, it was so. Let's say um, Buck Row Bands of uh, Buckaroo Banzai. Yeah. 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 yeah, Kind of a kind of a Ready Player One eighties, actually. I would yeah. say. Yeah. Um, but uh, in the future, in in the future, Turbo Kid. If you all have seen that, <laughs> oh yeah, Turbo Kid's amazing. Yeah. Right. Um, so 
We threw all of that at him and said, um, oh, and also make it time travel, mm -hmm. um, multi worlds time travel. And so th that's you know that's kind of his thing. So I'm excited because we got Will, uh, Will Parsons back again, mm -hmm. doing a time travel thing again, and it's showcasing our role with its system, mm -hmm. which is the diceless. Uh, fast-paced, card-based. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that. We need to we need to market that. Um, <laughs> fast-paced, card-based. Fast-paced, card-based. <laughs> Niceless system. Um, that that is all about plot and all about um, character elements. And it it was well to use exactly the right word. Uh, wicked awesome. Yeah, <laughs> it was wicked awesome. It's wicked awesome. And, um, and just like from a uh, like you know a, a proud parent watching their child grow up, as it were. Uh, I was very excited to see that the system did exactly what we wanted it to, mm -hmm. which was we spent very little time talking about mechanics and rules and all this different stuff. We we even maybe left a little bit too much out as far as like which cards we were playing and what yep. their star, star values were. But, but I thought the, it worked out. But really the thing well. is that that was visual cues for us as the players. Exactly. And we didn't have to talk about. And that, that's exactly what it was meant to which do. Which is yeah. what the system was designed to do. So it might be kind of fun. Uh, well, we're definitely going to do a post mortem mm -hmm. uh, episode with that. So it might be kind of fun to talk about some of the scenes and what those scenes were mechanically um, and, and exactly exactly how that came about with some of those more meaningful uh, cliffhanger type moments where we even around the table and the GM literally did not know how the scene was going to play out. Mm -hmm. And yet we still managed to, I think, tell a very excellent story mm -hmm. that was a lot of fun for all of us. And yeah. that's, you know, that's a tricky balance because when you are um, producing shows like we have done in the past, mm -hmm. sometimes it's, it's easy for us to go in and know exactly how the story is going to be. Mm -hmm. With role play, it's a little more interactive. Mm -hmm. um, some of the Eden Project stuff comes to mind, and our post-mortem post is available for that, mm -hmm. um, the, where we talked about, we had no idea where this was going, and this was the thing I made up, and then we talked about this thing, and I ended up doing it as the GM on the fly, and mm -hmm. I hoped it worked, and it did. And mm -hmm. all that stuff. Um, so it would be great to talk to Will about that and do that post-mortem soon. For sure. Um, but at any rate, I'm, I'm very excited because it's it's going to come out around the same time that we release the uh, the system for play, mm -hmm. and so it's going to be neat, I think, to give people the opportunity to do the pay what you want model that we're doing for that system, um, and also uh, have some examples of play and, and just kind of let let it be sort of Doc and Kruger's first ship out of the gate, if you will, <laughs> for our, our collaborative design. And then hopefully soon thereafter, um, Mind Will Follow, which was designed in a very similar vein, but mm -hmm. but with uh, you know dice mechanics and long form storytelling in mind. Yep, uh, pun intended. So, <laughs> uh, what else? What else is there to say about Roll with It? Yeah, just wait for it, listen to it when it comes out. Mm -hmm. There so. you go. And season three is going to be coming Good. out first. I think we're going to aim for a uh, mid-March release. The long-awaited season three World War II campaign. Yes, the year and a half after we actually recorded it. GM <laughs> by Kevin Paul. Yeah, but what's I, amazing... I thought, I thought it was on MIA, actually. Well, there you go. Right. What's, what's uh, amazing about that Prisoner of War <laughs> is that um, it is being... Um, the, the sound is being done by our sound designer, uh, Nick. Mm -hmm. And so this the work that he's been doing on that this whole time has has just been amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, cu custom scored, not like yeah. uh, not just you know we we threw together some background tracks like in a video game and just played those while we talked. Right. He, and, he's actually going moment by moment and mm -hmm. making the music for it. Yeah, and, and as you know, you know we have we have themes for all of our segments, and, mm -hmm. and he does those the segment themes. But um, what I really love about this particular thing is that he's actually giving a score and, and, and doing the whole season. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I'm excited about it. Um, it's in the can and ready to go and, you know, watch for it. Our, our sister show, the Roll With It show. Um, and more features to come. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. All right, guys. I, I, I would be remiss if I did not talk about Horizon Zero Dawn. Now, depending on exactly when this episode releases, it may actually coincide with the release day um, or, or be a day you know, out ahead of or behind, which means that nobody's going to have a, had a chance to you know, go platinum on this thing yet, except for the reviewers who've already done so. And those are the guys I want to talk about. So for those who don't actually know, there's something called a uh, review embargo. And this idea of a review embargo is restricting the release of the reviews until the very last minute. Um, now, some are for it, some are against it, um, but 
you know, the those who are against it say, well, the problem is I can't cancel my order now. I can't cancel my, my cruise. Uh, that the bad press that this thing gets hurts people. And so um, – those that are for it say, no, it's a very good thing because what it gives is a fair opportunity for consumerism to genuinely make its, uh, you know, Metacritic to, to make its decision, if you will, uh, as opposed to uh, IGN. Mm-hmm. And, and so I, I'm curious, actually, just right out of the gate, uh, what, what do you think, Eric, about mm. the idea of an embargo? And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that I found when going to the videos right now. Sure. Um, <clears throat> like you said, I mean, I think there can, can be arguments made on both sides. Um, what's been interesting about this particular one, which I know that you're going to go into, mm-hmm. is the fact that I didn't even realize that there was an embargo happening on this, because I, I haven't been following a whole lot of Horizon. Um, we forgive and, you. Yeah. <laughs> you're wrong. Well, well, you no, 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 no. <laughs> like, I'm very interested in the game, but um, maybe it is that interest that kind of makes me shut it off as yeah. well. It's like I like to go into especially something like this. Oh, that's, that's totally fair. A whole new IP. That's kind of why I'm interested in it, is even if the game itself doesn't totally capture my attention, the mm-hmm. idea of... We know that Sony is going to be interested in like really fostering this into being a big franchise, yeah. and so That's it's true. fun to come in on the ground floor of something. This is like That's when true. the first Uncharted hit. This is like when the first God of War hit. You know. You know, it's funny. I've heard comparisons to both of those games mm-hmm. in terms of Horizon Zero Dawn. I've also heard the the phrase um, the open world game for people who don't like open world games. Hmm. Which is really interesting. So, for clarification, um, yeah. the embargo isn't necessarily. Um, like what every publisher will typically tell a reviewer of here are sections that we want to make sure that you don't say. That's that's typical par for the course from my understanding. And it varies from game to game and yeah. publisher to publisher. And in this case, Sony had their hands on it. So yeah. it was very professional and very well done right. uh, in that sense. But keep going. Yeah. So, for, so really in reality, what the embargo is, is just simply actually not allowing people to release their review, even mm. if they've had a review copy for right. time. Um, but... What's interesting about this scenario is the fact that I didn't realize that there was one because there were so many people who, a week before launch, Mm -hmm. were able to start releasing their reviews. And that's because the embargo was lifted last week. Okay. So that's where we stand. Okay. Is quite literally last week the internet exploded with game footage for Horizon Zero Dawn. And I know this because I have been following it like a fiend. I have not (laughs) been as excited about this game since probably the original Assassin's Creed back in 2000 and what was that, 8? I I mean, literally, even, even the excitement that I had for Fallout 4 is nothing compared to the religious fervor with which I have had search strings going to my email to tell me a new video has been put up by somebody. (laughs) And here's why I'm talking about it today. It's because nearly every single video that is popping up, except the, let's call them the pirates, um, the video pirates, not the game pirates, there's a difference. Um, the, The ones that are going up start with, thank you, Sony, for the copy of Horizon Zero Dawn. Here is my review now that the embargo is down. So what I think is really happening here is, and this is what I really want to talk about, is that the game embargo in this case has worked. People are honoring it. Hmm. And within the, call them the terms of the embargo, what it's basically said is we're going to give you a game a month out. Now, now t- this is kind of the calendar here. About a month ago, this was back in January, a select number of YouTubers, call them reviewers, that kind of a thing, were brought to California, to L.A., um, and uh, were allowed to play the game for about three hours. Uh, this was about seven missions worth of stuff, and they talked about that um, once the embargo was lifted last week. But then another select group of them, basically all the ones who were there, as I understand it, and a a few others, were given copies or sent copies uh, so they could take home and play more. And so now what we're seeing is this this review that's within that context, and there are rules. You can't do five minutes of a single uh, play of anything. You can't do specific missions or main missions of anything. You can't have more than 20 minutes of footage combined uh, off so of your trying, channel. They're trying to avoid spoilers, right? Correct. And so as soon as the game releases on mystery. Tuesday, what we're going to see is a huge flood of people who've prepared their video and they hit go, basically. They probably already got it uploaded to YouTube. They're just going to, you know what, you know how that works. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, you set the date. So, 
and, and then what we're going to start seeing is the Let's Plays and all the traditional spoilery stuff. But where we're sitting right now is this magic moment right here, right now, where we have a couple of hours worth of footage. I mean, literally, you combine everything that's out there right now. You're at about two hours, including the trailers, of what we know and how we know it. And everything I just told you is a summary of it. And it's this beautiful, cooperative, almost Shangri-La type of <laughs> let's all play together kind of gamer culture thing that I just think is so beautiful. So what do you think? What do you guys think? What, knowing I, that, do I just game embargoes be, work? Well, I just, I just wanted to be a little cynical about you this. You no. Yeah. I know. <laughs> um, just mainly the concept of, okay, all these, these different reviewers are getting the advanced copies, which is great, so they can have content ready to go. Yeah. They can get more um, ad money, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So it discourages them from being too critical about the games, in That's my opinion. That's very true. Um, it's not always true, but... Yeah, you so... Know, some I, and I, and I some have been pulled. Some of some of the, right. the, the game companies have been pulled from the list, and they've been shouting, like, we, we don't get our free games anymore! It's not fair! Right. And, you know, it's like never, Kotaku is yeah. probably the Well, it's, it's never... Example. It's never... Um, and and I, think, I think that's fair for... For, for example, um, Kotaku had a problem where, in my opinion, they weren't talking enough about the game itself. They were sort of taking, like, a meta view of it, of, like, right. where it fit into, like... Well, it was also their thing. Right, but it's like... Who, Cares. People just want to know about the game. Well, the fans of difference. Kotaku cared. <laughs> sure, fans. Um, but, <laughs> right, but uh, but not actually people that are you know playing video games and want to know about the game. But my point about the actual game itself, like for Horizon Zero Dawn, if you're actually looking for, I want some some critical analysis of this game because obviously the game's not perfect. I mean, oh, maybe it is. I, I, I would extremely yeah. doubt that it is. Though. No, I could so I could tell you a couple of problems people have cited. In fact, later as later footnotes. If sure, you and and in a few minutes we'll be talking about Final Fantasy 15. Again, At which point I, I'll be telling you all the things that are wrong. <laughs> well, but it's also but you may not have enjoyed the game. I enjoyed the game quite a lot, and I will also say many negative things about it because I'm Same a very here. critical yeah. person. Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. it's important for sure to not just gush about a game, mm-hmm. but to give people up front. Here's some of the issues that are, that this game has. Right. It's just to be honest about it, and mm-hmm. I do feel that um, when you give people give you give people advanced copies, there's this expectation that it's going to be positive because they know that if they're not positive enough, if they're too critical, they may not then get the that next free copy time, next time it comes, they're not going to get their free copy. Mm-hmm. So, so I understand they're following rules with the game embargo, but there's also the unwritten rules that they're also following. So is it working? Well, those are social rules, though. Yeah, but but it, it, is it working? I mean, how do you define working? Is it helping the, the company itself? Is it helping Sony market this game? Of course it is. Yes. Then this, in that sense, it's working. Is it helping the consumer um, learn about the game in a you know fair, real way? I'm not so sure about that. To I'm going to send you the link, I'm not Jim, so sure about that. To ACG's Hero, uh, Horizon Zero Dawn review, buy, wait for sale, rent, mm-hmm. or never touch. Because I think that um, I think his particular review is exactly what you're talking about. There is something negative in every segment, but at the end of it, he still gives it a high score and says it's a wonderful game, and uh, I think that everyone should give it a try. Well, what I like doing with anything in terms of reviews is I want to hear the most negative review possible <laughs> and start hearing why someone doesn't like something. And if it's just if it seems like a really petty reason or that they just don't like the genre, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, okay, cool, this is actually really good. But sometimes they have legitimate legitimate complaints. Makes sense, yeah. You know? yeah. Like, you don't like Metal Gear Solid for a very specific reason. It doesn't... I understand that reason, and therefore it doesn't really... Can you explain it to me? Because I still don't understand why I don't like that game. <laughs> That's a totally different subject. It's, oh, yeah. we don't, we don't, let's not go off on a... I, I kind of have, like, two major thoughts, mm. two uh, useful pieces of information, if you will. First of all, you mentioned that there's that explosion of content that came out that the week, like, the day that they lifted a certain part of the embargo. Yeah, it was perfectly timed for yeah, the hype. So, yeah. one that's interesting for the hype, but also because explosion of content means trending. Yep, um, exactly. So, that's basically, true. you're able to manufacture um, a trending thing for your game at a very specific mm-hmm. time, which is interesting to me. The other thing is that um, I, I thought it was interesting what you said about how people are honoring the no spoilers thing because they thought it was such a good ending that they want you to see it for yourself. Mm-hmm. I wonder if this would work with the game that had a bad ending. Well, I think that that's the interesting part because I think that there's two different kind of conversations that are kind of being had simultaneously about this topic. Is mm-hmm. On one hand, it's kind of the uh, ethical and, like, kind of the ramifications of 
um, embargoes. And if you are one of those selected chosen to be able to have the ability mm -hmm. to be a part of it, then you want to continue to be a part of it unless you're big enough of a name that then, like, say, like a Jimquisition, who has himself found himself in the position of often taking an extremely critical view on games and find, and there are some companies that have stopped giving him games, yeah. kind of like Kotaku on that same light. But I think that most intelligent publishers recognize that it's still important to give it to them. And so the people like the Sonys, like, will still give him games, whereas, like, the people like the Activisions have not. That's a good point. Um, and so... It's part I, of the culture now. Yeah, exactly. It's one of those things that, on one hand, it is up to the publisher, because you want, actually, I think, critical people to say bad things about your game so that the cynics will still... Um, recognize that, and just simply because it's important to have both sides, I think, unless your game is absolutely perfect. And that right. could be, then, as we go into the other conversations having right now, is this odd thing that Doc brought up where it seems like everybody's kind of saying the same thing. Yeah. And in almost yeah. every other situation that we've had like this, where there has been an embargo in which reviewers have had a really long time to really sink their teeth into it, somebody spoils it. Mm -hmm. Somebody, There's always some bad egg that wants to ruin the party for everybody. And the fact that we haven't witnessed that with this game mm -hmm. either just simply goes to show that Sony has either instilled the fear into <laughs> these guys, <laughs> or... That's what I think happened. Or yeah. it's just simply that... But I I, I don't know. I'd be going out on a limb to say that's not true um, because uh, any, it, any company can do anything. It's, yeah. it's, it's a philosophical uh, you know, difference here. You know, are people fundamentally good or fundamentally bad? <laughs> yeah. Maybe and they so, just vetted their targets really well. That could have been it as well, and that has been a yeah, little bit of what I've seen is a lot of YouTubers who it. thought that they should have been on that list that weren't. And right. so it, it might be a much smaller list than like it probably should have been. Yeah. If but, you think you should have been on the list and you weren't, you probably shouldn't be on that list. Yeah. Because, yeah. <laughs> because from, from Sony's perspective, they're using this as a marketing tool. Oh, of course. That's what they want. Yeah. So, so, Absolutely. For, so they're picking their targets very carefully, which, you know, I, I can't blame them for that. It makes sense for, for their company to do that. Yeah. I just mean from a consumer perspective, it's not as helpful. I would rather have some more critical voices. Yeah. So on the flip side of that, though, and Doc, you would know better than me, um, the kind of the person who wants to believe in the good of people. Um, <laughs> not, nothing against against that. Just the, that's, that's just the way that I, I happen to be. Um, and I'm often naive and will be let down by people because of that. But, <laughs> suck. Yeah. Um, but, um, so Doc, you'll know better than me. Uh, have there been any spoiler casts out there at all that you found? No. And See, and that's what's interesting is because, yeah. like, you brought up Kind of Funny. And, like, as somebody who mm -hmm. uh, reads and watches a lot of their stuff, mm -hmm. uh, I guess not read as much anymore, but listens and watches to a lot of their stuff, um, they'll typically do a spoiler cast yeah. for stuff, especially when they do that roundtable review. And the very fact that they didn't on this they was They tagged really it spoiler-free. They were the yeah. only ones that I saw that tagged it spoiler-free. Like, as if because it's they very important. Yeah. yeah, and as if it's very important that, like, they... They want everybody else to experience what they experienced. Mm -hmm. And I've been racking my brain. I feel like there was a game in the past few years that kind of went about the same way. And I can't, I can't think of what it is. I know that even a lot of Let's Plays of those that I've watched, they specifically say at the beginning, and it'll be interesting to see if they do, even Let's Players for Horizon do this as well, in which they say, I'm going to play it, obviously, I want you to watch it, I'd prefer you to go play the game first. Mm -hmm. And it'll yep. be really interesting if people do that. And so it could just simply be as well that this game is that good. It could um, be. I guess they'll we'll find is. out. This is the Mobile Minute, where we share something new or noteworthy about those computers we keep in our pants. So I've been playing a lot of Fire Emblem Heroes lately. This is a um, Nintendo's newest mobile release. And it's a uh, reimagining, I think, of the Fire Emblem series. It's, um... It's it's kind of like got this collectible aspect to it where you can summon different heroes from different games and the the story of the game is definitely uh, nothing to write home about. It's just kind of like the, the, the crossover justification type story like, oh yes, a thing is happening and we must summon heroes from across all the worlds to fight it in this one. Um, Do they appear in the real world and you have to throw Pokeballs at them? Uh, no, no, not quite. Okay, not <laughs> are, are you um, a fate-like summoner? Is it like Fate's Day? Um, not quite like Fate, okay. but yeah, it's not a terrible, uh, not a terrible comparison, I suppose. <laughs> um, but basically, the, what they've done is they've distilled the experience of Fire Emblem in, I think, a really smart way. Um, they keep the map, I think it's an 8x6 grid, um, whereas it's going to be much larger in uh, real Fire Emblem games. And... Um, 
you it's got very simple touch controls to move people around your movement uh because the map is so much smaller your movement range is also much smaller and they've taken out things like for example um ability to dodge um which speeds up the game quite significantly basically if you attack someone and you're able to get the first hit in um and you don't get killed by their counter attack you know how much damage you're going to do um, and what it really comes down to is, uh, you know, trying to exploit the weapon triangle, you know, like axes beat lances, lances beat swords, swords beat axes. Um, it also applies to magic. So what they've done really is it's more like red beats green beats blue beats red. Um, so it's like they, they used to have a separate triangle for weapons versus magic. Um, one, one of the more interesting elements of this game, too, is how you level up characters. So their characters have a, a rarity um, that's represented in stars. It goes from one star up to five stars, and five star characters being the best with the access to the most special skills, the best weapons, uh, all this different stuff. You can actually promote people. Um, it becomes more and more expensive with each um, level of rarity. It gets really hard to promote from four to five. Um, so what you really want is to summon the five star instead of having to build the five star. Um, but it's still an option if you do want to. There's a little bit of a uh, arena mode um, where you can go and fight other people's teams and try to get rewards, uh, which do play into being able to level up your characters. Um, there's a stamina thing where it costs a lot more stamina to do higher level missions, um, so you're going to run out of ability to um, play after a certain point, but you can restore that with potions and possibly with orbs. Um, the only uh, in-app purchase is actually these orbs, which are used to summon or to occasionally restore stamina, that sort of thing. And I, I actually haven't felt that there's a need to uh, to um, spend money to get these orbs. Like It's a much slower to earn them by going through the story and stuff like that, but you earn them at a good enough rate that you could probably play the game totally free, see if you like it. And then if you find that you get to a point where you're kind of stuck and it's like, okay, I just want to sort of boost myself with more heroes, then you can consider money or spending the money to, to um, buy the orbs to summon more heroes. So, so, so I summon a hero. Mm-hmm. It dies. Permadeath? There is no permadeath. No, that's, well, that's not, not interested. Not interested. <laughs> <I'm out. laughs> it, it's a good thing there's not though because, because well, when you're dealing with real money, <laughs> yeah. well, when you're dealing oh, with real that money, makes it even better. <laughs> but it's like real life. But yeah. also yeah. because in these fights, because I mentioned there's basically guaranteed damage. Like you know, sometimes you'll go up and attack someone and do no damage. But like if you, there's no t- chance to dodge, sometimes you just have to make a sacrifice in order to you know open up the opportunity to take out the rest of the team. And so if there was permadeath, I would have lost so many units so many times over, it would be ridiculous. Gotta have so. a better strategy, Chris. <laughs> you, issue there. Do you have to res them or anything like that? I mean, is there a cost to bringing them back? Or There is a thing you can do. Um, there's a special item you can use that will bring, like if you get a game over, you can revive all your heroes, mm-hmm. um, which lets you usually pretty easily finish off the rest of whoever's left. Okay. Um, they automatically come back otherwise, mm-hmm. is what you're saying. Uh, right, like well, after you after it, you win, if like you lose three characters in the battle. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's no, like they're out of the fight. Yeah, they're out of the fight. Mm-hmm. And, okay, that's an old and convention then, then, for like superhero yeah. games. Um, also worth mentioning that your team size is limited to four, and you're usually going up against teams of three, four, or five. Usually four. Okay. Um, so it's it's little micro battles, and they go pretty quick. Um, it, like I said, it's a nice condensed version of Fire Emblem, and I think they do it in a smart enough way that even though it's very different in certain ways from the Fire Emblem we know and love, it's also a really solid, well-designed game unto itself. And now, this week's meaty topic of discussion. Let's move on to uh, our roundtable segment on Final Fantasy XV, a game which apparently came out last year. Yep, <laughs> November of last year. Which I've learned recently. I only <laughs> played it recently myself, as in the past week I've been playing it. Um, I've put about 22 hours into the game over the past week, uh, which is actually pretty good for me because I don't have as much time to play video games as I used to. Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, Chris, for letting me borrow the game. You're I did not beat the game, so I just want to put that out there. So far, I'm at, I'm at uh, Chapter 8. Um, I've done a lot of side quests, though, so I feel like I am qualified to discuss the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, Eric, Chris, have y'all both beaten the game at this point? Yes. yes. Okay. And how many hours did it take y'all to beat the game? I actually probably should check that. Um, <laughs> I was around level 50, I mm-hmm. think. Okay. Um, and I want to say it was somewhere around 40 or so, mm-hmm. 35 to 40. I think I did it at level 45, somewhere between 45 and, like, 47. Um, and I think it took me about 44 hours. Mm-hmm. Um and that's with a little bit of side questing and grinding. 
And Chris, I'm um, sorry. Doc, what about you? Well, actually, you're further along in the game than I am. Okay. I, I'm also um, playing on a borrowed disc from my dad, who picked it up not having a clue what it was at all. Um, and he said, here, you want to play it? Because I'm, I'm still playing Just Cause 3. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you asked him why, and he goes, Just, just Cause. Just Cause. That's, yeah, that's, that's why. Um, he said it three times. You, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Just Cause. Just Cause. Just cause. Just cause. <laughs> Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, so, I, I don't know. Um, it, you know, Final Fantasy is not something that I've, I've been real big on, mm-hmm. but there there are moments, and I've enjoyed them. You know, some of them off and on. Just none of the recent ones. So let's let let's actually talk talk about that for a second and start at the beginning of the game because mm-hmm. when the game yeah. first loads up, I love that moment. Yeah, <laughs> but but when the game first loads up, and I'm not even talking about even the game starting. I mean, yeah, the no. first thing you see on screen it says a Final Fantasy. For fans and, and first timers, first timers, I love it. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting that, that they put that in there. And mm-hmm. I think for me, this game, Final Fantasy XV, is very much focused on this kind of nostalgic experience. Oh, there's very many call, there's callbacks to pretty much every, well, not pretty much every game in the series. Some of them are very obvious callbacks, <laughs> like you purchase soundtracks for basically every Final Fantasy game in the series. But then others are. You know, you may not recognize that reference unless you had played the game. Mm-hmm, like right. the behemoth from Final Fantasy VI is one of the monsters that's in the game that you have this whole experience with. For example, to use one example, um, but that those that sort of things are littered throughout the game. Yeah, and I missed most of those. Um, right, I actually thought the soundtrack thing was kind of cool, and I and mm-hmm. I did end up getting some of the soundtracks for the car. Um, because it's essentially a driving game, uh, except it's not. <laughs> uh, and, but you know, so that part was cool, and, and I liked those callbacks. But uh, the other references were completely lost on me, except maybe the chocobos. So this is... So, I know what a chocobo is. So <laughs> we, we're all coming from a very different place, too, fr- in the series. Correct. So uh, me personally, I've played every single Final Fantasy game, and there's only a few that I haven't beaten, and that was just because I didn't like them well. Like, I didn't like 12 well enough to beat it. Uh, I actually disliked 10, but I still beat it grudgingly. <laughs> uh, but for the most part, I think I've beaten all of them, um, except for the MMOs, which you can't... Arguably, can you beat an MMO? I have played both of them, though. Yes, in yeah. fact, I put a lot of time into both of them, but I didn't actually... I don't know if you could beat them. You can level um, cap them. But I am a longtime fan since the very first game in the series. Doc, is this your first Final Fantasy game No, you not, not the first. Um, it's sad, though. I mean, I, I literally cannot remember whether I played 7 or 9. <laughs> Um, well, what characters were in it? Or what was the theme? You know, the guy with the sword. And the really big sword? Yeah. That, that would be seven. seven. That would okay. be seven. Cloud. It was Cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah seven, Cloud. Yeah. Okay, so that was seven. So I played seven. <laughs> I didn't beat seven. No, it's nine, because then you have the character with the tail. Sure, if you say so. The Zane has, um, the, Zane has the tail. Yeah, but, anyway. you know, I, I, had, I had a roommate back in the day who enjoyed them, and he played some of them and watched some of them. But you kind of remember, I'm not a fan of anime. Um and so this just feels like a, a video game version of an anime and long form storytelling in that regard where you you know you stop off at a town and then you spend 10 hours there that that's something that just never interested me because I'm an explorer game type I would much rather go out there and just explore 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 and and when I get repeatedly killed or thrust into the random encounter I hate random encounters actually um, in the traditional sense of I'm walking around in the overworld and then it takes you into a screen and you fight a thing done you know that's not that's not I, fun for me that's actually the opposite of fun for me it's frustrating for me so in that regard there's fundamental aspects of the Final Fantasy design process that I just don't like is that true of just the JRPG design or particularly Final Fantasy? Um, I would I would say most of the JRPGs that I have played in the past I have not enjoyed because of that aspect. Yeah. When I hit the open world portion, I explored around enough to be able to say, "Cool, I can see it. I'm good." So was that like chapter two or three? <laughs> no, um, I mean, it was right. I mean, I think like um, chapter three was called the open world. Right. If I remember it was correctly. it was about chapter four or five, I think. Mm. Um, I mean, and, and in terms of story, because see, it's so nonlinear, it's hard for me to say what the last thing I actually did was. I got to the big city, the one that's like um, Rio. <laughs> it looks like Rio de Janeiro, yeah. mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and. And I got the there, solemn, right? and I then I, I, 
I went down and and got this. I guess it was like the second the weapon behind the waterfall. Mm-hmm. Right. Sure. So I went and did that. Um, I ran did, around in a chocobo you, did for you a bunch. Fight, did you when you went there there to the waterfall? Did you fight the giant snake? I level ran from it. Fifty four or something. Yeah, I ran oh, from it. I'm just yeah. curious. Yeah, no, I did not. There's no way I could have beaten that. <laughs> um, and that's where I sit in my save file. Uh, is pretty much having just accomplished that. I went to the center to try to find the meteor, and they were like, "Oh, big robots coming and attacking, and you can't go here yet." And then I beat them all. <laughs> um, and I opened up an, you know another area of the map, but there were at that point I was I was so lost in the terms of what the story was supposed to be that I was supposed to be doing, and I'm like, why is this dude who's the prince of the land um, <laughs> just running around like some bozo doing a bunch of side quests? And it and I was kind of done, and I set it aside um, and started playing uh, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. So it it it. Part of it for me was the characters didn't do anything for me, um, and part of it was I saw what I wanted to, and I was impressed with what I saw, but it wasn't enough to keep me in that world. It wasn't enough to make me stay. So I, I do think, because um, it took me a little while, and this is why I'm only at Chapter 8, to mm-hmm. actually get to Lestalem, because I was trying to, I was kind of fell into the completionist trap initially, where I got to, I believe it's Hammerhead, the city with uh, uh, Sid and Sydney. Mm-hmm. Um, and I started doing a bunch of quests around there, and I just well, like a pit stop, really, right? But I just started doing every quest before I before I got to Lestalem. So I kind of I kind of gained a lot of levels, gained a lot, uh, and performed a lot of quests, and put in a lot of time in the game before I even hit Lestalem. So by the time I by the time I got to Lestalem, I felt like I'd already I think I'd already been, geez, I think I'd already played like. Almost ten, more than ten hours, I think, at that point. Mm-hmm. And then the rest of my time was just me, just trying to, just intentionally trying to stay on the main quest so that I could get as far as I could, right. you know, in the time that I had. Yeah. Um. So, so Eric, um, when you played through the game, what was your sort of approach to it? Um, I guess it was a little bit of a mix of the two, um, because I'm somebody who I I absolutely adore um, open world games. Um, Going back to, like, I'll often cite, like, one of, like, the more important moments of, like, my childhood and, like, kind of recognizing, like, my love of game design and games was GTA 3. The mm-hmm. moment that, like, you finally take control of the car and you can... It, it's really cool not to go on a total, like, tangent, but, like, that moment that you realize that you can either take a left or go straight oh, in Liberty that's City. That's the moment. And you finally realize this city is real. And yeah. it's super cool. And, like, I've... And since then, I've always been in love with that idea. Um, and so because of that... Um, open world games can be time sinks for me mm-hmm. um, just because I will kind of just check off boxes and I will be the person who um, will take forever to finish one of those games just simply it's the very reason I've never touched The Witcher mm-hmm. it's because I know I'll, I'll never finish that game mm-hmm. um, and I probably won't ever play any other game because of it <laughs> um, it's part of the reason I stay away from MMOs and so I think that a part of it is <laughs> I need move. to yeah um, and so I think that a part of it was, especially at that time, I'd set aside that month to two months because I am a huge Final Fantasy fan to dedicate to it. But at the same time, I also knew there were going to be other things that I wanted to eventually play mm. again. <laughs> and so I would have my sit down and I'd make a decision of, is this a story night or is this a I'm just killing some time night? So I'd do a little bit of the two. And then once I got deep enough in the story, around chapter eight, actually, that's like really where I feel like the story kind of takes... Um, it's iron fist over you, and you really just kind of want to get through it at that point. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's already feeling like a bit more linear. Yeah, already. Even though I could, I could have technically stopped and gone back and done. Yeah. They, they keep giving you warnings mm-hmm. at, at, at mm-hmm. that point, where and a little bit before that too. I think around chapter five they start doing that, mm-hmm. where it's like, um, okay, if, 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 are you going to actually, you know, ride with Arden or whatever and drive? If you do, you can't come back for a while. Right. So it just gives these little warnings along yeah. the way, which I, which I think is interesting because they, they're trying not to break that open world. You know, the first warning is fake out though. Do you, do you remember? It was if you go to the other continent. Um, you're not going to be able to come back for a while, and then you you can't. Right, spoiler: because, you can't get the ship. Yes, um, yes. because because of the attack. The atta- the, yeah, and so you don't you don't go on the ferry at all, mm-hmm. and you end up staying where you are. And and that moment, that almost it was almost meta, and it was almost cognitive dissonance in the sense of this game just lied to me. <laughs> That's so well, cool yeah. because it played yeah. into my expectations, expectations and knowledge <laughs> that. Um, you know these these games have major chapters, and we're about to take you to a major chapter that is right. different from the. And no, no, you're right where you were. You're stuck where you were. You're sleeping in that same tra- trailer you slept in last night because, dude, um, 
you're, you're stuck. What's going to happen? You've got to go finish some missions and do some things and make some money because, dang, dude, do, it's great. Do we want to talk a little bit about just how often that Final Fantasy XV breaks that fourth wall? <laughs> it, it regularly... That's, yeah, that's, it an, that's an example right there yeah. where it, can, it gives you those warnings of, oh, um, you're not going to be able to come back here if you, if you go on this, this, but, this element. But, but isn't that the nostalgia that we were no, just talking about? No, that, on that no, first splash well, screen? But, but it does as well in the very fact of that it gets really meta in odd ways. <laughs> right. Um, of the fact but, of like, yeah, yes. they make references to... Uh, you can buy the soundtracks right, I was for other mention, games. Yeah, the soundtrack is a great yeah. example because mm-hmm. it's, it's this element of, wait a minute, so... Is is Noctis going to the store and buying the Final Fantasy soundtrack? Like, right. is he just buying it? That's what it seems like. Right. You know, or you go, but to they eat. have video games within this world. They like do. you would think that yes. at that point maybe they just the simply fan- reference the other Final Fantasy. Maybe Fantasies, all the Final Fantasies are games that are actually <laughs> right. existing in yeah. 15's world. Right, and so it's weird to look at. And then they have that, and they also have, if you notice, uh, various product placement mm. littered throughout the game. Yeah. There's uh, <laughs> Coleman, Coleman, yeah. Coleman, the uh, the you know outdoor uh-huh. company. There's uh, cup noodles yeah. are all over the place, and specifically the Nissan cup noodles, the direct company cup noodles and the, these sort of things are littered throughout the game and every time i see it it just it feels weird because on the one hand i think they're trying to make the world feel like oh this is like a real place because it's kind of it's kind of uh it, you know modern inspirations and all that but then at the other hand it just sort of breaks that wait am i in a fantasy world or not what is this place yeah and same deal with the with the environments themselves you're sort of in this um almost like a like a 1950s i think we talked a little bit about yeah. this chris like a 50s a uh, war torn fifties world or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like this weird kind of. It's a post World War II nineteen fifties mm-hmm. that it, it went in a different tangent and had fantasy elements because a big meteor crashed. Is really mm-hmm. kind of the way I felt about it. Yeah. Now that said, um, there were some problems I had on a fundamental level with the world. For example, at night, giant demons come out. Yeah. They're super scary. They built a big wall around their capital city because of it. Why are there rest stops that sell candy bars and uh, cars because the with bright, gas. Because the bright lights scare away the demons. I know. But it seems like, I don't know, fencing would be good there too. Uh, trains, maybe? Or, I mean, you know what I'm saying? There was, just, there was a cognitive dissonance there at some core level with the world that is powered by crystals. The most important object in the world is that crystal that that kingdom protects. And yet, I go to the power station, and the power station has um, this thing that's happening out of the crystals that came from space, right? Uh, Because that's how the the power works in this world. And yet, there's gasoline. All I'm saying is there was a little bit of a dissonance there for me of, this is totally our world, except in the places where it's not. And if they'd worked just a little bit harder on world building, I think I might have bought into the fantasy a little. I I will say that there was definitely... they. They phoned in a lot of like the world building. It was very much like we're we're, we're going for a visual aesthetic, and that was beautiful. And we're going for you know here's our theme, um, but let's not think about it too much. And one of the things that I think this ga- that Final Fantasy 15 does well is you know it's kind of this fun experience, and you have a, you have these characters that are just kind of you know they they, they they interact with each other. They kind of have this fun little banter and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But you can never really take what's going on too seriously mm-hmm. because the game just. First of all, the game doesn't, to me, doesn't even feel like it's taking itself seriously mm-hmm. most of the time, to be I quite agree. honest. Yeah. Um, which is fine, which is perfectly fine. But, um, yeah, that's a tonal decision. Isn't yes, it? and I, I, think, yeah, sure. I think it's just the game is not trying to go for that, we're going to build this super deep world. We're just trying to create a space in which people can have a fun experience. Well, and that makes me really think uh, and wonder where they're going next. Um, because oh, with like, the series itself, yeah, with the series right. itself, because it's in a really interesting place right now. Um, part of the reason I thought that that splash screen that you had mentioned, and like I, I almost kind of like teared up a little bit when I saw that mm-hmm. um, of the of Final Fantasy for fans, eh? because that's really like from what I understand from a little bit of what I was following when this game was coming out. I was kind of doing my typical. I care about this game, so I'm not going to follow it at all. Um, is when uh, the director and I think lead producer, I think that he had the kind of two roles. Um, um, Hajime Tabata came onto the project. He was actually an outsider from, I believe, Square in general, but mm-hmm. I mean, a, definitely an outsider from the Final Fantasy series. And the very first thing that he did when he came in um, is he looked at the team and said, um, 
we are changing a ton about this game because, of course, it was originally Versus, and um, the yeah, idea well, for, Versus thirteen is yeah, that? yeah, yeah. 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 The game has gone 13. through a lot of sort of um, changes, shall we say? Because yeah. it was it was delayed for quite a while yeah. to the point where people thought it was I thought it was years. dead. I just assumed people it was thought it was yeah. dead, and and it, it just sort of it became it originally was going to be Versus thirteen, and then finally someone at Square Enix realized, wait a minute. A lot of our longtime fan base didn't really like 13 that much. Maybe we should try to just make this its own thing, go yeah. in a different direction with it, which I think was the right decision. Probably. Um, just make a clear But yeah, what he is, then essentially, once they knew that this was going to be a Final Fantasy, he essentially told the team there are too many Final Fantasy fans on this team um, because it had been a lot of the same people who had been making the game since some of the first ones had still been there. Um, and then the people who grew up on those games, and then their dream was to work for Square, and then they got there, and then they wanted to continue to make the same games. Mm-hmm. And his argument is we were not going to do that. Um, And so it's in this really interesting place in that you can tell that they're trying to capture a lot of, like, the new elements of, like, what's popular in games and Mm -hmm. in game design today of, like, embracing a more open-world game and kind of toning down a lot of the seriousness in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. and yet, like, still embracing, like, this really heavy and and when... You put them to the narrative it's, it's the when you put an, them it's together. It's the anime melodrama. Concept. Yeah, absolutely. It's and yet, anime. like, it works really well when you don't have that. The rest right. of the experience is wonderful. Right. Um, and yet, then still also embracing a lot of what made Final Fantasy unique unto itself. Like, when the first one came around, what made it so special is it was a turn based RPG, but it bucked a lot of the other trends that, mm-hmm. like, the other ones were doing at the time. And part of that was being a little bit darker, being dirtier, and, like, kind of having a more steampunk element to it. And and of course, then you had the tradition of the crystals and the four heroes of light. Yes. And so, like, this game still tapped into a lot of that. So when we talk about the odd elements of the world building, that's a lot of it. Yeah, and so, like, I, I wonder if maybe that's also part of why I was a bit more accepting of, like, the strangeness and, like, yeah. kind of the piecemeal that it was as yeah. they kind of put the world together is because I could tell this is what they're kind of doing. Um, and, they're, and they're harking it, back. It, it almost felt like a... I hesitate to use the word reboot, but it almost felt like that. Like they're they're kind of trying to go back to the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, having played all, all the Final Fantasy games, I just kind of noticed the, these trends that they keep coming back to um, after a certain length of time. Like from in the original game, um, they sort of re- return to that um, four heroes of light kind of concept, or the crystals as a concept. Um, arguably, Final Fantasy IV sort of did that. They didn't have the four heroes of light, but they returned to the crystals. They had the fiends come back and all that kind of thing. Final Fantasy IX definitely tried to tap into the nostalgia of the series and really focused on, hey, the crystals are back. These are the heroes of light that are going to go out and, and etc. And this game, I think, kind of returned yeah. to that as well, where it was, it, especially this one, really kind of cut back. Here are the four heroes. Um, it did sort of have that element um, of we're going to bring in like the guest companion temporarily which i thought was a neat touch Mm -hmm. and i hope that they keep doing that as the game continues but um it it really does feel like they're they're trying to almost say okay all the other final all the all these other final fantasy games were leading up to this experience and we're going to acknowledge that all of them existed and we're going to make references to all of them and they were all good in their own way but we're doing something different now right yeah i completely agree and like, and I'm glad that you brought up kind of those major points that this has kind of happened mm. in the past in the franchise of like four. Um, a lot of people, like, I always like to cite four as um, not the first true, but like the first of what a lot of people consider Final Fantasy as mm. being Final Fantasy. Because it was one of the first ones that really inserted um, a story, uh, a character based story. Oh, into but that's. It. So from the Western perspective, from the Western you perspective, play Final Fantasy yes, II, yes, which I yeah. have, the original, um, it actually was the first one to do that. But okay, you're right, yeah. from the Western perspective, a lot of people think of it that way because that was our Final Fantasy II. Yes, right. Um, and and it, it did focus a lot on those you know, character, which, and maybe that's something we should talk about too in terms of just Final Fantasy XV. I mean, what y'all thought generally about... Uh, you know the four heroes, mm. and also the other you know side characters that were introduced to along the way. I mean, did you think this was a cast that is an endearing cast that stuck with you, or mm. is it more of a kind of forgettable cast? I mean, what were your thoughts, Chris? So it's an interesting thing because I, I think I talked to you a little bit about this one point, Doc. Yeah. How there was an article that I read, and it wasn't about Final Fantasy fifteen. I think it came out before Final Fantasy fifteen, mm. but they were talking about. I think it might have been a Gama Sutra piece um, about how. 
people don't really remember the plots of video games. Um, they would basically do, there was a study that was done where basically they asked a bunch of people to describe in detail the plot of their favorite movie or TV show or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then to describe in detail the plot of the games. And they found that people could do really well describing the plot of stuff other than games, but on games they couldn't really. But what people did a really great job with with games is describing the characters that they liked. Um, the, the characters really what came alive. And I think that this game is kind of capitalizing on that. The, the story um, to me felt more like kind of an outline where we checked off the boxes <laughs> of the outline yeah, without fleshing in anything between those points, which is something you need to do in mm-hmm, fiction. Mm-hmm. But the emphasis wasn't really on the story so much as it was on the journey. It was about the characters. And, you know, well, the, the characters took a little while to grow on me, but their mm-hmm. personalities definitely become very distinct by the end of it. And while the side characters are pretty forgettable, um, I think that core uh, group... Which, and, and honestly, for me, mm-hmm. the side characters, I've actually liked them so far. Um, I, what, what, I've liked. What was her just... name? Is it? Is it? And I, I'm so bad with names. Is it? Iris. Iris. Yeah. Iris. Iris was cool. So she's yeah. interesting. And mm-hmm. then also that. What's her name? Um, Anea. Aranea. Aranea. Yeah. The the dragoon lady. Yeah. Um, I I really like. Yeah, her. she's super cool. <laughs> she's yeah. very cool. I loved her. Um, the character design too, where they kind of, again, a reference back to kind of the dragoon it's aesthetic. Yeah. Yeah, they totally. really kind of. They, she had that helmet, the mm-hmm. dragoon like helmet. She has the. She actually has the jump move that the dragoons have. The with, giant lance. With a giant lance. Yeah. yeah, it's very cool. I was like, hey, I kind of want her to come along with yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> She's pretty um, awesome. She she actually does make some appearances later on. Oh, cool. Um, cool. Yeah. Basically, when you're fighting demons, she'll like take a um, a ship and she'll like dive in and help you out and then leave as soon as the fight's done. And y'all y'all caught that initial where they they made reference to her um her red ship. She had like a red ship. Um, They're referencing the red wings. Interesting. Because that was where we first saw the <laughs> oh, dragoons wow. with sure, the red wings. Totally. Yeah. Huh. And I didn't would, catch that. That's I like, missed that's that. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, yeah, so speaking of the story, and the, in case it wasn't clear, you know, if you've been following our podcast, you know that our roundtables are definitely very spoilery. Um, yes, that's we, true. We're, we're going to go ahead and give you, again, the spoiler oh, warning. I'm going to be so sad. We're going to spoil things. In fact, <laughs> Jim, Jim and Doc uh, have not been through the entire game, and we're going to mention things that they haven't seen, but they have consented. I would like to talk about as well this, just the, the gameplay system itself and really the, sure. the way the combat works and, and, and all of those things. Because, I mean, we're... My first experience with the combat system, and honestly, was um, it's kind of frustrating, yeah. just because it feels it doesn't feel like you're completely in control of what's going on. I agree, and that that kind of annoyed me because I like I like first of all I like micromanaging, so I would prefer to just control everyone. Mm-hmm. But I understand the game is trying to have this action you know experience, so they do the whole teamwork element, which I thought was interesting, and I, I used that a lot. I got used to it, mm-hmm. but. There are some issues, in my opinion, with the camera, um, especially when oh, you're yeah. in certain environments. Like if you're in um, certain enclosed spaces, or if you're surrounded by, especially at night, um, trees or, or rocks or something outside, it can be kind of difficult for to to know where Noctis is. Uh, sometimes you'll get like knocked down because you're surrounded by enemies and you can't tell where you are, and the camera doesn't quite know if it's supposed to go like higher or off to the side and. I had some uh, kind of a frustrating experience with that, and then also with your character. My characters would get stuck sometimes in dungeons. Like recently, when I was in the dungeon um, with uh, with Ana- Ania, Aranea, Aranea, yeah, Aranea, the, the dragoon lady. Um, I had my characters just get stuck on stairs, for example, and I would I would be going down the stairs, and then it was just Noctis versus all the enemies by himself. That happened to me more than once, and I would have mm-hmm. to run backwards. Mm-hmm. And then, then go up to, to go up to meet the person, and then kind of nudge them along <laughs> around the stairs, and then keep going. Like yeah. I had this weird experience, and this happened to me more than once. I had issues inside, like an earlier in the ice cave where I was battling some one of the spiders. That was a terrible one for people yeah. getting lost. I fell off a couple of times. Well, that's what I was about to say. I fell off, and then I got what, ha- what happened was oh, I fell off, but only Noctis fell off. Right, because with that, with the warp point, they didn't really test the warp oh, point very well. Me, actually, yeah. so you use the warp yeah. point, and then sometimes it'll just knock you over an edge. Yeah. And now your your friends are still up there fighting, but you're not, yeah. and you have to you have to go all the way back around. You can use a warp point to get back up there, actually, yes. or an enemy mm-hmm. if he gets close enough to the edge, yes. you can warp, warp to the enemy, yeah, yeah. do a warp ah. strike, and get back up to the top. But if the enemy falls off, this happened to me. If the enemy <laughs> falls off the edge, I don't know if this happened to y'all. No. I had the giant spider <laughs> fall off the edge. Mm-hmm. So I see it fall off the edge, and I go, okay, I'll just go down after it. Well, <laughs> it glitched out. And so the giant spider is just sitting there, um, and it's, it's regenerating health extremely quickly oh. because the game thinks that I'm no longer in combat with it. Mm. 
but it actually is still in combat with me. So I have to some, and I actually was able to kill it eventually. It was actually quite challenging, unlike most of the combat. But it had the super regenerating health bar of like an, an enemy that was not in combat, and yeah. yet it was still in combat. But it wasn't actually moving; it was just standing there casting its lightning spell. <laughs> if, if you know the, the giant spider thing yeah, that I'm yeah, talking yeah. about. It's very, uh, very interesting uh, way to experience glitches with with this combat system. I like kind of what they tried with it, <laughs> but um, there's a lot of ways that your characters can, your other, your other, your AI characters can get stuck, or they they're not doing what you know you tell them to do in terms of some of the extra moves. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the warp point ability, which is really cool in theory, but there's so many ways you can glitch the game with that. Yeah, <laughs> that's my experience with games. Is I'm always trying to find like a tricky way to do something <laughs> in a way that's like the better way. Final Fantasy XV doesn't like that. They have a lot of scripted, especially when it comes to a lot of the little, um, all of the mainline quests. They're very scripted. Um, It's not, you're now here, go here, this is your goal. It's, first you go here, once you go here, then it'll tell you the next place to go. Then it'll tell you the next place to go, and eventually you'll work to your goal. that's true. So if you try to do things out of order, and you find a way to kind of sequence break, like... You know, like like other games encourage. If you try to sequence break in Final Fantasy XV... You break it. Mm. That seemed kind of true with the side quests, even. Mm. Just the way that they were done. Um, you've got a side quest that's go kill a thing. It's a hunter mission, um, and it's at night. Mm. And, it, and it immediately pops up with a heads up and says, would you like to wait until night? Well, no, I don't want to wait until night. But then there's nothing else to do, and there's no way to get to night. You can, once you're at night, you can skip to day, but there's no mechanic for skipping to night. It's interesting. I didn't think about that. That's a good point. And though. so you're literally just standing around with nothing to do for half an hour there in real times. time, yeah. unless you quit the mission and then like do it again. But the only way to quit a mission is to go take a different hunter mission. And some yes. of them you're not leveled up for, so they won't let you take. <laughs> so there were, I had some of these kinds of problems with it. Um, it, you know, it, I had similar kind of frustrations with the driving. We haven't talked much about that, but Chris, it, in one podcast, you, you refer to it as uh, kind of a, a road trip game. Mm-hmm. And, oh, it very much is. And I, well, the problem that's is the theme of the game. I'll say that. right. Well, theme thematically, yes. Yeah. But the mechanic of a road trip is going from one coast to another coast, or getting from point A to point B, and making sure you have enough money to get there, and that kind of a thing. I'm talking about Jalopy here. Mm-hmm. Is a road trip game. Okay, this is not a road trip game in the sense that um, you're driving in circles. It, it, this is a a cruising after hours game. This is a it's Saturday night. What are we going to do? Let's go down to the Sonic, which we do every Saturday night. Mm-hmm. You're going to see the same people, the same places, do the same things over and over and over and over again. And I think that really gets to the core of why. Even though I have a lot of admiration for the things that are in the game, it was not compelling for me because I'm like, really? You want me to go back there again? You want me to go see the scantily clad woman again? <laughs> um, her name was Sydney. She had a name? Yes. Oh, sorry. I didn't listen to anything she said. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm never sure. Is it Cindy or Sydney? No, it's, it's Sydney. Okay. Because I, I believe so. Because I think they were trying to make, basically, like, they had... It's Sid. Right. But yeah, it's no, female. but there was Sid, also yeah. Sid. Because remember, yeah. initially in the game, people were speculating that they had... Because, you know, Final Fantasy always just had Sid since the yeah. second one. Mm-hmm. And they were speculating that Sydney was just replacing Sid, but then it turned out they Sid is still Sid there, is the right? father, but then she's also kind of replacing Sid too. It's just they kind of have both of them. Yeah. Regardless, she needs to buy a better shirt because <laughs> she outgrew that one when she was five. <laughs> she oh, chose to wear it, and she can just wear whatever she wants. Well, it's fine with me. To, to go back to something you were saying about like the combat, which I think speaks to the whole theme that we're talking about yeah. here. Um, you remember in the early fallouts how you would get into a conversation tree with some of the. Um, NPCs who were tag-alongs, you know, the companions, and you could kind of give them a general direction on how to fight. You couldn't control them directly. Yes. And if they died, man, it was awful, and you had to either reload or let them be dead. But what you could do is you could say, hey, I want you to be a little more aggressive. Mm -hmm. Or, you know what, hold back. That kind of a thing. Just that would have been awesome in combat. But instead, what I got was, hey, knocked. Yeah. 
how do you like my photos? <laughs> who do you want me to focus on? And, and I'm like, I don't care who you focus on. Stop taking photos during the freaking battles. And instead, let me tell you that I want you to play defense and I want you to play offense. And you know so, what I'm so saying? Inter- interestingly, they did that. They actually had that system essentially in Final Fantasy XII. Mm-hmm. They they let you kind of customize how you're the sort of how the AI. It's you age to old, go. man. I couldn't believe um, it wasn't in 15. What I thought, what they did with 15, they kind of made it. And this kind of goes back to that, you know, Final Fantasy for both fans, but also for the first timers, mm-hmm. because they they made it a lot simpler. Where the AI does its own thing, but it sort of picks, like for example, if the enemy, if if for example, like Ignis can care, can also have a pole arm as a secondary mm-hmm. ability, a secondary attack. If the enemy is weak against pole arms, he'll use that pole arm, mm-hmm. right. but he's not going to use it unless it unless it makes sense to use it. Or same thing with. Uh, basically, just all all of your 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 buddies. Mm-hmm. Same thing when it comes to healing healing uh, you know Noctis or someone else with little you know first aid kits or what have you. Um, it's all kind of set up to help you. They're more like your helpers. They're not really your team. They're like your helpers. Okay, then explain to me why it is that when I go into a cold area. Everyone starts complaining about how it's cold and they need their jackets, but they're not smart enough to put them on themselves. I have to go into a really clunky menu system and manually dress them. Well, like well, because dress then it starts well, to actually affect. Because they have stats. Yeah, the yeah, clothing has stats. stats. So if you change, so they, so they're even though they're saying that you don't have to change their clothes because if you when you change their clothes, you're really just changing your own stats. I didn't you know to, that. I thought that was well, just. It's, that it's, was I, I assumed though. that health would be affected. And I mean, we're, this is a game where you health have to is eat. effective. Health, health is effective. Yeah. But, but is is it is it? You're not. You're not draining. You're, you don't drain health. See, from and so I didn't know. I, I, and I, I just. I mean, I, every you time do, they complain you do about it, heat sometimes. I, well, and and see, this is the thing. To me, they're simulating the wrong thing in that in that moment, making those decisions. Um, and I'd love to talk about the saving because man, saving is so broken, and leveling up is so broken um, in that regard too. But um, with the campgrounds, but but basically, what the the problem that I had was. Instead of being able to be like a one-time decision of, you're my best friend, so I really want you to hold back and play defense. Mm -hmm. Do a ranged thing. Here's your gun. Instead, what, what I ended up doing was not really caring what they were doing in battle and making sure that I survived. Did, did you not use the, uh, the, team, the teamwork abilities? Yeah, or but go into the ascendancy tree and like get new abilities. Okay, so a, them with and a, I didn't really know what they were because they were called stupid things. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I think that could be just because you didn't get quite far enough in the game to see all the different abilities. you Oh, get with that's the a AP. terrible excuse because I was but, twenty hours into the game. But you just said you were you were only. I know. I was. Okay. All, I know. So did you actually use the ascendancy tree? Like just. I don't even know what that AP? is. I don't have a clue. What it that was is. called ascendancy. ascendancy. Oh no! Ascendancy you're barrel. talking yeah. about the thing where you where you're unlocked stuff. Grid. Okay. <laughs> basically, so, so I went down a different path with that. Basically, because okay. I wasn't using those those team abilities any. I, seriously, so, I played for ten hours before I realized they existed. So that's part of the issue then, because um, that's where that customization that you're talking about with the characters actually comes into play. Mm-hmm. So you initially they initially start out. Each of them have one teamwork ability mm-hmm. and it's it's very specific to like their their character but if you go in and you and you you look at i think it is actually called a teamwork tree yeah. right mm-hmm. yeah. when you go in there you can buy different skills with right. your ap and then those then you then you assign those skills to them and then they then, then when you call that in combat it does something different like for example that ignis, makes sense ignis has one where he gathers everyone together and like def, sort of like defensive mode and mm-hmm. you all get kind of healed yeah, you can, mm-hmm. for example it's 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 pretty useful they all have and like uh, uh gladius has one where you know, it's just like a big sweeping strike, and he's hitting a bunch of enemies. But then he has another one where it's specifically targeted to just one enemy. So mm-hmm. it's like really powerful, but it only hits one enemy. Or you could do one where he hits everyone, but it doesn't hit for as much, but it knocks them down or something. So what I did was I bought so that's where that stuff that gives in. me bonuses to AP, like driving around. Yep. So that early, in the, I was playing a long game. Mm-hmm. So that early in the game, mm-hmm. what I was, what I had was a bunch of really cool abilities that gave me lots of AP by literally just doing nothing. So the, the, one of the the core problems I have with this game, and then I'll shut up and let you guys defend its, its <laughs> awesomeness, was I was like, okay, I need to go to this area. Um, and so I, I hit go, and then they all get in the car, and they go, and I go make myself a sandwich. <laughs> literally. Go make myself a sandwich while they drive there. This is a major problem for me. 
major problem. Now, um, Chris, at one point you said something like, if you've been there before, you can fast travel. You can. Yeah. yeah. The, you have to pay for it. It's only it's, 10 gil. It's 10 gil. It's literally it's I know. Like nothing. Which, why do they make it pay when 10 gil is nothing? I know. It, yeah. It's yeah. literally nothing. And, and, and that's the cost of gas, too. So yeah. it's like, just abstract all that out. <laughs> Again, you're simulating the wrong things. Whenever, whenever food costs like 20,000 gil... <laughs> What? No, you're on a road trip, dude. Well, that's because oh, you that, can get cheaper food, right? Too. You can, but the but expensive it food gives you better stats. See, that's what you're paying for. And and again, you're simulating the wrong things. You know what I'm saying? I mean, these are a bunch of dudes in jeans who are hanging out trying to figure out how to get their kingdom back by um, trashing bozos and killing demons. And that's what it should be about. And I didn't feel that way. What I felt like was a whiny little posh boy who was going. <laughs> I want to make sure that I have the right food because I grew up with a nanny and I have royalty. If, if you think Noctis is whiny, never play 10. <laughs> <laughs> never play Final Fantasy. That's, what, that's my point. Is, is it's like, it Fact, seemed like anyway. all, they, they were simulating all the wrong <laughs> things for me to really get behind the character. I, I think, to be honest with you, I would probably feel very similar to you had I not gotten farther in the game yeah. in terms of the chapters because I really do feel like um, it starts to open up more in terms of the characters' different personalities. In fact, there's this scene um, with between Gladi- Gladius and uh, Noctis when they're inside the volcano yeah, glad running from Titan and basically Noctis doing his, you know, kind of complaining that he does. And mm-hmm. I wouldn't even call it whining, it's more complaining. Titus yeah, is whining, is. Noctis is complaining. That's true, actually. But so, so as he's complaining... Um, uh, Gladios, Gladios like, just grabs grow up, him, dude. <laughs> just kind of grabs him by the kind of like the scruff of his collar, just just picks him up, and he's like, "Dude, you need to grow grow up and stop complaining. You're royalty. What the hell's wrong with you?" Kind yeah. of conversation yeah. to him, like it to a point where I thought he like there was this moment where he has this look in his face, like, "Is he gonna just punch me in the face?" And it's a common thing in anime too, to like, yeah, "I'm gonna sure. punch him to run." I'm, I thought he was gonna punch knock this <laughs> yeah. for a while there. He didn't. That's so cool. I think that there's there's elements of of that that come more and more into play as you get to it. They okay. have these. These elements of you're just driving around somewhere, and this is where your your ha- go eat sandwich thing kind of comes into play too. You're driving along, and this happens more and more as the game progresses. Suddenly, there's this character scene between two of the characters kind of pops up. Mm-hmm. Prompto now has something that he wants to talk to you about, and now he's sort of suggesting, "Hey, let's go over here and let's do this. Let's go take a photograph of this thing over here. You know, like a, fo- a photo op opportunity, mm-hmm. or like you know, Ignis comes in and he says." hey, I think it'd be really interesting if we go over there and we see what this thing over here is about, and it opens up a new side quest. So there's little things that you might be missing, these sort of like character interactions that are happening more and more kind of as you advance. And I don't know if those are just triggers in terms of location or if it's how often you um, use teamwork abilities in combat or what, mm-hmm. but... I think that they're triggers based on the map um, because there are even some cutscenes uh, that only happen at certain campgrounds or that only happen um, at the certain pit stops. Too. Yeah. Like one of the best, like to to me, like <laughs> I adore Prompto, and yeah. part of it is because of his backstory that they don't touch on much yeah. during the game. That's, that's, I only know because yeah. I watched the anime yeah, that came right. out beforehand. Oh you really? Know? Um, and that, he has a wonderful really backstory on why him and Noctis are friends. Hmm. Um, and they, they that rooftop scene that you're yeah, like, oh, and that? so they yeah. they talk yeah. about it a. Little Oh, bit very top. It's wonderful. And so they have a few of those moments, but it's interesting in which you're talking about and where they kind of focus on the wrong thing mm-hmm. is that's what this story is about. And my biggest and most inherent problem with this game is my inherent problem that I have with open world RPGs anymore. Mm which is that they still try to apply linear storytelling in the same way that like you once did before you had like this open world design mm-hmm. to a game that doesn't require Thank that. Thank you. Um, and this game would be a near perfect game to me. It, like uh, take away the combat and things like that, but from the cohesive whole of what it's trying to do, um, if it didn't have the story of the fall of the kingdom and him trying to get it back because then you don't get all the narrative dissonance of I should just be playing through this story because yeah. I'm the prince and I should and I my dad died and my fiance is gone and like I have to I have to get the kingdom the, back. The emotional but instead, urgency, exactly. Yeah. But instead, mm-hmm. I'm going to mm-hmm. go ride chocobos for 15 hours because mm-hmm. that's what my friend said he wanted to do. And there's no reason that he should have suggested that mm-hmm. in the first place. Right. Yeah. Um, and so on one mm-hmm. hand, it would make the road trip make more sense mm-hmm. um, because then they wouldn't have money. They'd have to build it themselves. Right. You know, there would be all of those things. They'd be on the run, and you'd have the emphasis on what. It does well, which is in the characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and instead. 
instead you end up losing that because not only does Eric here, as I'm playing this, feel bad that I'm not just playing through the story, but this is what's actually fun. Mm-hmm. But then also it would give them the time to focus on those things. Um, or, or, well said. or do the reverse. But yes, that's the other option too absolutely. is to just focus on the linear the linear story if they mm-hmm. if that's what they want to do and that's the story they want to tell focus on that and yeah. you know cut down on all of these crazy side quests and the open world elements and it and become that's when you either get way well but either way <laughs> no no because thirteen was too linear but mm-hmm. Final Fantasy games uh, like have a history of of still having like you know here's your linear story that you're going to tell it's just the problem with 13 was that it was an on rails game yeah. basically like there was no other way to go like you go into a you know quote dungeon and it's just a straight line that yeah. was the problem yeah, with yeah, 13 yeah. Mm-hmm. but you know if, if a game like you know final fantasy 4 it had one story you're not going off on all these little ta- like tangents they're all part of this big story right. but you don't necessarily have to it's not going to it's not going to say Go to point A, go directly to point B, go directly to point C. There's like little things that you can do in between. So it's mm-hmm. kind of this mixture. And I think with Final Fantasy 15, it kind of like what you were you were sort of saying, Eric, is it, it's sort of it's trying to do kind of both. It's trying to look at oh, open world games are the in vogue thing, so we're going to capitalize on that with with our game. But we also want to keep that traditional linear story that that people that Final Fantasy fans tend to expect. So we're just going to do both and see right. how that works. And it. Does it really work? And to be honest with you, that's a big problem, I think, just in open world games in general. I it's not something agree. just for Final yeah. Fantasy Fifteen. And I think yeah. the game the games that do it well, you need you need you know, very strong writing, but you also need to have, you know, a real understanding of just how linear you're gonna you're gonna make it and, and the story that you're trying to tell, the linear story that you're trying to tell has to fit in sort of seamlessly with these side quests. And I think, you know, for me, Game that does that extremely well is something like Grand Theft Auto Five. Mm-hmm. I think the Grand Theft series, the Grand Theft Auto series in general, does a good job of balancing. We're open world, but there's also this story that we're trying to tell. And Fifteen was kind of, in my opinion, the culmination of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Red Dead Redemption did a pretty good job oh, of yeah. it as well. That's another one. Yeah. Um, but I, I just I have a lot of respect for Rockstar in that. But then again, Rockstar kind of pioneers when it comes to mm-hmm. this genre anyway. So that's probably why they're so good at it. Um, but, but, I, but I've got to throw in that sure. that's exactly what they were saying about Horizon Zero Dawn. No, we're done talking that those, about that. <laughs> those <secondary, laughs> no, that those secondary missions but, were tied in in that way. And you know what the right. example was used? At Red Dead Redemption and... Uh, the, the uh, Grand Theft Auto. I mean, that, those, those they're are getting the into dangerous territory comparing this I game know. to so many good games. Well, then maybe it will do what I hope somebody finally has the guts to do, which, which is? is to create... Um, and of course, it's not really role playing, but to create an open world, truly role playing game, but to create an open world game that doesn't have that overarching narrative, yeah, allow it to be more slice of life. Yeah, that makes. I some feel sense. like this game, would, like fifteen, would have been wonderful if it had, like, so, I, so Minecraft. <laughs> Maybe without the crafting, I, and I, I'm not, a, I'm not even a Minecraft fan, but that's kind of the first yeah. place my mind went. Uh, but I, I see. But what you're like, I mean, I, I had said like that. going up yeah. into this game, um, completely ergodic, in other words. Just totally open without like you're, any you're kind of mainline story. You have, ex- story. you have experiences and, and side quests, but there's no mainline story. Yeah, and maybe if there is an overarching goal. Like, mm-hmm. I had joked going into this game that I was really hoping in watching the anime and watching, like, the film beforehand that this was really just going to be the story of the four guys trying to get to the capital mm-hmm. for Noctis's wedding. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If that had been the story, there yeah. would still be urgency mm-hmm. of a... Of a sense, yeah. but then everything else that you're doing just ties into that mm-hmm. of exactly what the road trip is supposed mm-hmm. to be. And to me, that would have everything else they had in the game would have fit in the I characters, in the camping, in all the side missions. But you didn't have this overarching story that like there's no reason why the character should be ignoring this. See, mm-hmm. what, what I actually thought it was going to be, not knowing about what the story was before going into the game. Just look at the character designs and sort of some of the image sides of the world. I thought it was just this is a boy band that is going on tour, <laughs> and you have to go to different spots in the world to hit your tour dates. But otherwise, you can do whatever you want in between. You just got to hit your tour dates. I so, like, you that. go to you go to La Stalem, Your tour is in nice. like like ten days. You have ten days to do whatever you want. But then you go. But on the way, you're getting to La Stalem, You do your little concert, and then you move on. And I was I was I was ready for that. I'm like, okay, I'm ready for this. It'll be very interesting. Oh and then it kind of went in a totally different direction. I'm like, okay, this is cool too. But why does why does why do why do my team look like? They look like pretty boys. It's, it's like a boy band. Group. I mean, it's like no, it's very not, much yeah. Noctis feels and the Demon Hunters. Yeah. that way. It really does yeah. feel that way. Um, 
But I do like the in terms of the design, like you were saying, just the general characters themselves of the personalities. I did I did like, and I yeah. agree with you that story wise, if they had focused more on just the characters and just having those experiences and not having this linear story, because to me, I had trouble actually following some of what was going on in the linear story. Like the, the it'll get worse really? where you are. Well, the yeah. first the first cutscene, for example, where where they're they're invading the kingdom and and, and the oh. king dies and all that. I'm watching that and I'm like, wow, this is beautiful. This is like this this art, the animation. I agree. That was, pulled, is I agree. Awesome. That was pulled straight from King's Glaive. That was their, yeah. that was their advertisement to make really? you watch the film. Well, well, yeah. when I saw that though, I'm, I'm but I'm watching that and I'm going, this looks great. I don't know what the hell is happening. Am and I then they never actually explained it. Yeah. yeah. Am I supposed yeah. to know what's going on? And then all and you. So that's that's an interesting point about the transmedia aspect yeah. of this is that they. They, you get a better sense of the world and the characters if you watch Kingsglaive and if you watch um, Brotherhood. Brotherhood. And what is that? I don't even know what that is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that, so, that's kind of the problem. Is so that they, they, have a, yeah. they, they kind yeah. of lean on the transmedia without really like telling you, hey, go watch the transmedia or without oh, like, kind man. of like hinting you in like, you know, hey, yeah. for those of you who didn't watch the movie, we're going to like sort of sneak in some like a, a plot summary through character dialogue. They made the saying. Animatrix error, in other words. Mm-hmm. The one where, look, we made this really cool reference to this short film you haven't seen. And people in the theater went, what? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Totally didn't get that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, Check it out. They walked off screen here and walked on screen mm-hmm. here in the video game. People in the theater totally didn't get that. Yeah, imagine for somebody who has, like, finished the game, mm-hmm. um, having because you watched King's Life. I watched, and what's interesting is I actually watched both of those things after I finished the game. Oh, interesting. Oh, yeah. Okay, so did and I didn't even watching know King's Glaive change your opinion on Luna Freya at all? No, actually, her her character stayed about the same. For okay, me. Um, but what it did do is it it really reinforced the theme of responsibility and kind of like the the role of the hero or of the king, because you know you mentioned like the the lack of sense of urgency. Why are we going on this road trip? Yeah. And we need to mm-hmm. be getting to the thing, and part of that is actually part of Noctis's character arc. He's basically it takes him a very long time to sort of come into his role as like I'm king and I've got responsibilities and I need to do what I need to do. Um, that's part of his character growth. And so while so there the, might have the been... The hero's journey. He's rejecting the call. Oh, yeah, yeah nice. Yeah. Throw back for you, Doc. I think that's actually a very good point. And because the story isn't front and center during mm-hmm. a lot of it, for some, like, over a 40-hour period, mm-hmm. until you start to get to those moments, you yeah. hit one of them, mm-hmm. of Gladius. Uh, of yeah, Gladius, the, the, yeah, the yeah, Gladius yeah, yeah. leaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a few more of those as it goes on. And actually, like, a pretty amazing moment with what they do with uh, Ignis mm-hmm. um, at that one Man. point, which I don't even want to give away. Yeah, actually, I, I do want to give away. I, I, okay, I would okay. say... So, <laughs> if, um, if it's very important to what you're talking about, mm-hmm. but don't it, just it give well, away. it's interesting what they do with characters mm-hmm. and the utilization mm-hmm. of handicapping. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that, that, that's yeah. that's exactly what I want to get into. So you hit a point where you finally in like there. So I'll say like all the complaints you guys have about like oh it didn't feel like the side point, side quest at any point or meandering. This game worked for me because it suited me as a player. Oh, the I, way that I play these sorts of games, I like the side I, quest. I, I follow the yeah. mainline story pretty much exclusively. I only do side quests when I need to grind for experience or when it just sort of happens to be convenient or oh, really? interesting. Okay, to me. and mm. so in that sense, I actually felt like the the journey made sense. I didn't feel like I was circling too much. Occasionally I'd have to go back and do a thing, but they sort of explained with we need this thing in order to get to the next point. And so over time, through chapter to chapter, you're kind of discovering like, okay, now we're going to work our way over to Cape Kayam. And Cape Kayam is where we need to get in order to find your dad's old boat that's going to be able to take you to the star to uh, Altitia because you couldn't get on the yeah, boat that was supposed that, to take that's you. That's kind of like where I am basically okay. right now. And so as soon as you get to Altitia is when the game starts to sort of become... Like, okay, now we're going to just focus in on the story and we're going to go forward. Really? Okay. Yeah. Um, and there's this big, um, th- there's this very big boss battle that happens um, with the Hydrian. And this is actually when you very briefly cross paths with uh, Luna Freya. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, just to briefly sidetrack on that boss battle, it's interesting because you sort of have this moment where your powers awaken for the first time. Uh, and so in this boss battle, you're fighting literally a god. And it's this giant um, serpent-like. They call it the uh, serpent-like monster. They call the Leviathan. And um, you know, this entire town is getting destroyed in the process. And like you sort of knew this was coming because they they set this up as you're going through it. Um, but the the town is literally just getting torn to shreds by this uh, this maelstrom that's forming as you're fighting this thing. And um, your powers awaken. You get to fly around. It's almost like Dragon Ball Z esque, where you have like Very the so. the weapons flying around you, and you get to like do these all all these ranged attacks. So it's it's interesting because it 
takes you away from the gameplay that you're used to, mm. and it hands you a lot of power, like, almost it felt like without earning it, which kind of bugged me at first, but then when I started to see how this is playing into the theme of um, becoming what you were meant to be, um, I thought that was really interesting, that it's like, hey, I didn't earn this, and yet I have it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that played into it interesting. But it's part of that big thing. Th- this is a very, it's a key turning point in the game, because um, Ignis actually gets blinded by mm. injuries. Um, and so he's blind for the rest of the game, which actually does affect you mechanically. He dies much more easily, that sort of thing, or he goes down much more easily. Um, he, it affects your, um, I mean, even just normal exploration and mm-hmm. navigation of the world. Yeah, and that you have to up. move much more slowly because mm-hmm. he can only walk very slowly. And they actually have the other characters, either Prompto or Gladius, mm-hmm. actually like kind of hold him and mm-hmm. help him as he's walking through dungeons. I am rage quitting this game right now. Wow. <laughs> Um, very, in this moment, right now, rage quitting the game. Very interesting. Um, yeah. Is that does that ever get frustrating when you're when you're absolutely? Playing it? It's, for it's me frustrating personally. for one dungeon. Yeah. Um, yes, that very first because one. they were trying to drive that point home during that one dungeon. Yeah, but then after that, it becomes much easier well, because I mean, it's a low point for Noctis, in mm-hmm. which Gladys right. is most angry at him mm-hmm. um, and really wants him to essentially take the throne mm-hmm. and be the person he's supposed to be, and Noctis right. isn't quite there yet. Mm-hmm. He's but also, of course, Noctis is also grieving because Luna dies. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, but by watching... Yeah, he's lost the two most important people in his yeah. life in the past week. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, then by watching Ignis um, and helping him, of course, and that's a major... Uh, I was thinking just from him. a combat perspective, like, it, like does it, is it you're in combat and now he's like... Almost a liability. Does I feel, feel like they very... probably did some of the that they made the enemies in such a way that you didn't have to that you could beat him with essentially mm-hmm. three, and they actually do eventually empower him, which yeah. which is kind of that's an entirely different mm-hmm. subject in how they um, represented mm-hmm. uh, handicap players yeah. or like handicap people. Because later on in the story, he basically learns to deal with this. Yeah, and, and he gets an ability that actually is because, uh, like, he, uh, you had mentioned mm-hmm. the power that he had, the teamwork ability of being able to heal, which is almost like a necessary ability to play through most of the game. Mm-hmm. You actually end up not wanting to use that because his other ability is so powerful, mm-hmm. and he's uh, only Libra able. To... Yeah, I think one of the things the game does really well, and again, this is from my perspective as someone who just did mainline story primarily. Mm-hmm. Um, after all this stuff happens like you go into like the world is entered into eternal night and everything is terrible and you know ignis is blind all this different stuff but then you get to go back and revisit the past because you talk to um luna's magical dog and um looking into his eyes like makes you reminisce about the past i guess but what was there's this really interesting moment for me where like you know you're i was i think the first time i did it i was in the middle of the dungeon where you're going through the the bowels of the empire's fortress and that takes forever. And I think they do that intentionally to like make it feel like this slog that you have to go through. But I revisited the open world, and like it's bright, and it's cheerful, and everyone's easygoing, and Ignis is back to his normal self, all this different stuff. And it's like this moment of, like, you feel really nostalgic, you know, like you really appreciated, like, man, that was nice yeah. <laughs> back when that was the case. And like, look at what the world is now, and it kind of like really makes you want to fix things because you want things to go back mm. to the way they were. Um, and then, uh, like yeah, like I said earlier, you know, the story felt like you know checking. It could it could have been a really great story. I'm going to cite an example of um, uh, Luna's brother. I'm drawing a blink on his name. Um, oh, oh, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, he's a good moment. I can't remember his name yeah. either. Um, but like, he has this thing where you, you basically find out that he it's was story, right? kind of helping you behind the scenes the whole time. Mm-hmm. And it would have been a really like poignant moment if we had seen him more than once, you know, right. earlier in the game. And he like, wasn't a jerk then. Like, yeah. I mean, and they're, they're like pretty standard JRPG conventions. Like, hey, you have to do a boss fight with this guy several times throughout the game. Like, even that would have made it. Is that the guy in the beautiful. trench coat? Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. no, 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 no. Or no, not, not the guy with the hat. You're probably thinking, you're probably thinking of Arden. Yeah. yeah it's I'm not him. Arden. It's not Arden. Oh, okay. Um, I, see that, I don't com- think you're far those, enough, I don't think you're far oh, enough to see him, actually. Combine those two characters. What do you mean? Oh, you mean the brother. Yeah, I don't think you're far oh, okay, I don't yeah, think yeah, you're yeah, far yeah, enough to see the brother. Arden. Okay. Um, but big, big spoilers here. Basically, find out by the end that... Uh, spoiler that is related to a point that you're making? Yes. Okay. Um, you find out by the end that basically... Noctis's mission is he has to basically give his life to end Arden, who is basically the biggest villain. Oh, with um, shock. He's like this old god. Yeah, basically. I figured Arden was or, a, a demigod, kind of. Um, but you have to, in order to end him, Noctis has to end up dying. And so basically you find out that this entire quest was eventually just trying to put you on this road to go do this thing. And so it's a story of the sacrifice. And I think that one of the, the best moments is right at the end, um, before you go into a boss fight, you get to choose a photo 
that you yeah. took from your trip, and you get to keep that because by this point, Noctis has figured out what's going on. He knows what he has to do. Um, so you go through all your photos and you pick the one that he keeps to take with him. Um, and then that one is basically the one that they put on your certificate of completion. And I loved the uh, like the last scene where they have a little bit of a flashback to what the last night they're camping before this all goes down. Mm. Um, and you know he basically the I think the final line was like, "What can I say? You guys are the best." And it basically brought that whole thing back to like this has been a personal story the whole time. This was about Noctis and his three friends going on this journey that's basically going to end his life. <laughs> um, and from that perspective, like put aside all the other stuff about like, oh, it's you know the what's going on with the world, what's the backstory, all this different stuff. I think that in that moment, I had like this really great sort of like. A satisfaction with the story. I actually really liked the way it ended. That makes me appreciate that scene much more. Mm. Um, because it was obviously supposed to be written as a heartfelt scene. And mm-hmm. it was after the credits had rolled. Um, with a relatively ambiguous final scene right before mm-hmm. that. Right. Um, in which it shows him on the throne. Yeah. But you don't know if he's really there. I, I think that one, because you also notice that that's transformed into the um, the logo. That was kind of cool. That was kind of yes. cool. Um, yeah. And then after that, like you know, the, it would always it was nighttime, and now mm-hmm. it's daytime yeah. on the main menu, which was kind of a neat touch too. Yeah. But I think that that was more um, metaphorical. I don't of think course. that was actually happening. Yeah. But it was it was symbolic of um, Luna and Noctis have both completed their quest, mm-hmm. their mission, and now they have earned their rest. Right. They're, they're both sleeping. Yeah. Um, which there's the, this big theme of like you know Noctis means night, and um, the the kingdom is called a. Uh, Oh, what was it called? Insomnia. Insomnia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So sleeping and dreaming and waking were all these big themes. Um, and you finally earn your rest at the end. I thought mm-hmm. that was kind of a, a cool sequence. Yeah. Um, and then, like, you know, in the final credits, I loved the, the... I think the photos were probably, like, one of my favorite, like, touches throughout mm-hmm. the game. Um, because then they start showing a slideshow of your photos from throughout your adventure as the credits are rolling. And yeah. I love... I, I, fig- love- I figured from the start when I was taking photos that was going to come I, I, I love point. I love player generated content in games when mm-hmm. like you know the stuff like you are creating uh, your adventure and that's reflected in the game back at you yeah. um, and like you know I actually have a lot of nostalgia attached to a lot of these photos I could go back and say oh yeah that was from the one where I got stuck on that dungeon for five hours yeah. you know or that's the one where I, I rode Chocobo like across the continent to get to the Stalm for the first time you know or that sort of deal so um, I don't know. I mean, like, all the things you guys were complaining about, I, they're definitely valid issues. And I'm not going to say this game is perfect, but for me in particular, all that stuff was stuff that, like, didn't bother me, didn't even occur to me in some cases. And the way that I played it, I think, really suited me, and I just found that it was a really great game for my personal taste, despite its flaws. Yeah, that makes sense. I, mean, I, I can say one thing that will invalidate hmm. everything that I've said up to this point, which is that I had some, let's call it meta-knowledge, that at some point... Um, the day-night cycle was going to change and it was going to start punishing me. Mm-hmm. And I assumed that that would be triggered by story stuff, so I actively avoided story stuff mm. and did... Um, actually, I, Eric, I, I play a lot like what you said earlier, which is uh, choosing whether or not it's going to be a story night or it's going okay, to be yeah. a, uh, you know, kind of a running around exploring night. And that's, like, that's totally the way that I play Assassin's Creed games. And I almost always unlock all the map and complete... It and like over level my character before I do story stuff every time, mm-hmm. um, and in this case that's what I was attempting to do, but the payoff wasn't there and I wasn't enjoying the process, and that's really what it came down to. So I may have actually harmed my experience mm-hmm. by s- choosing not to do uh, story stuff just because I didn't know when that day night cycle switch was going to happen. Mm, right. and, and I assume that's late game. Is that late game? Um, well, what actually game? is interesting is I haven't looked into this, but I f- it, it was the feeling that I got is as the story does progress, do, do the days get shorter? Yeah, it seems like yeah, yeah it do. seems like the night comes earlier. It definitely um, has does feel that way to me. Like yeah. I said, I had meta knowledge on yeah. that, that that was going so to happen, happen, and I wanted to avoid it. Yeah, um, and then uh, and then by the end, yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's night the whole time. So mm-hmm. I may have just broken my experience in it because I just I did not. There was so much I wanted to love about that game, and I just I didn't enjoy the experience mm. at all. Mm. I enjoyed the first couple of hours, and then I was kind of done. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, for me overall, and I've I've certainly been pretty critical of certain elements of the game, but I actually did enjoy the I've been enjoying the experience quite a bit, and I'm probably am going to go through and finish the game. Yeah, you're welcome to um, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, go for it. But. Uh, you I know, think that you're uh, at the point that it's worth because the story is yeah, becoming more narrow. It, it it's definitely feels more, that It's way. worth just grinding through. That's what I think point. I'm going to do is just to yeah. go straight through the the linear experience of the story and you know just kind of see where it goes. 
um, you know, how I enjoy it rather. But I, I mean, I would say this is the most that I've enjoyed playing a main mainline Final Fantasy game since probably nine. Mm-hmm. So I, I do think it's been successful in in you know kind of recapturing some of that allure of the series for me, mm-hmm. um, which is good. So um, I do think that it is it, it's it was successful in kind of tapping into that nostalgia that it clearly is going for. Oh, sure. Um, with with a lot of these little moments that we didn't quite touch on, but there's tons of things like you know the first time I saw the Magitek armor, I'm like, oh wow, cool Magitek armor. Or like when you know like that Behemoth fight that that I mentioned before, where they talked about this weird monster, and the first time that I see it, I'm like, oh hey, that's the Behemoth from you know Final Fantasy VI. Great. So little little things like that that they throw in, um, you know, I kind of get a kick out of that almost more than the actual story that they're trying to tell me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that nostalgia is really the key word um, with really just the entire game. Mm-hmm. Um, it's kind from, of the theme of the game just in general. Yeah, yeah. Um, in what they want to evoke from the player as either a longtime fan of what maybe they'll capture mm-hmm. um, or what you actually experience as the player towards the end of the game with mm-hmm. the photographs um, mm-hmm. and, of course, with the characters themselves, um, which I guess then leads me to the last question, since, like, nostalgia, like as you were talking about it, it did make me think about it and mm-hmm. actually kind of well up a little bit. Um, what was the photo that you chose? Um, and that, this is actually an interesting point because I've seen a lot of other people choose the same one. Um, oh, huh, it, it was the one underneath Cape Kayam, right? Yep, before that, that was mine. Boat. Yeah, because yeah. it's got the whole cast in there. Yep. And so that was I really I considered. I actually wow. thought for a bit on if I should just get one of just the four guys mm-hmm. instead. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, you can also just break it and just do something that was just, just obviously a bad picture. Like but, one yeah. of my favorites that I have right now is actually it's Noctis like on the ground with two uh, <laughs> two guys standing over him. <laughs> That's pretty great. Um, That's funny though, yeah. um, because I've actually never looked it up to see what other people chose, but mm-hmm. that was absolutely mine when mm-hmm. it was the only time that the entire cast was together. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that, and I, I picked that one kind of just because like that's probably the one that would be most meaningful because it's all your friends and that right. sort of thing. So that's for, for Noctis, at least. Of course. Yeah. Um, but on a second playthrough, I still need to go back and do New Game Plus. Um, I might choose something that's a little bit more personal to me in that sure. playthrough. Talk about so. Yeah, Chuck. Yeah. <laughs> so the New Game Plus mode is that uh, you start at that the level you left you off? You start on. at the level you left off on, um, and you keep all your items and stuff like that, all your abilities. And so um, I think you that way over leveled for everything. Uh, I am. <laughs> I don't think you necessarily would be if you started like right when you finished. Um, but I'm actually level 99 now. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> so okay. Um, and actually, what's funny is I've, I've thought about starting New Game Plus before, but it's like oh, I want to see if I can like clear all of the end game content first. And I'm on the final uh, secret dungeon, um, mm-hmm. which doesn't let you use items. Uh, so oh, really? that one I got about two floors in before I realized I wasn't going to be able to do it, so I might just skip that one. We'll yeah, see. you have to have a flying car to get to some of the uh, secret stuff, Jim. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, you get a flying car after. That's how they do the airship. The airship. The yeah, I was, becomes... I was wondering how they were going to do the airship because they always have to have that in the. Because where you're yeah, going, you don't need roads. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, any final thoughts on the game? Um, I think that for me, um, kind of like I said at the beginning of this, I'm very interested to see where they go now. Mm-hmm. Um, because in a lot of ways, I think it was a good fresh start for them. Um, they obviously can't grab the nostalgic goggles every single time for the franchise. Right. Um, and so they can't really do what they did with this one. Um, I'm really interested to see if they continue to move forward with kind of the more action-based combat that's mm-hmm. much more like Kingdom Hearts style. Mm-hmm. Um, partially out of a personal appeal, I hope that they don't, because I'm not that big of a fan of mm-hmm. that. I'm a much bigger fan of, in my JRPGs, I like something that's more turn-based. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Well, personally, um, I actually really like action a lot better. Oh, okay. So well, and, and I think that, honestly, mm-hmm. um, they'd be smart to go that route. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think that a lot of people are that it, way. It mostly worked. If they could fix some of the, the kinks that I talked about yeah. uh, you know, throughout, throughout this episode, if they could fix the, the glitches in the combat so that it's more um, effective. It's already pretty fun, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of it is just it's not effective. It's not as intuitive as it could be. Yeah. I, and if they, if they can fix that, then, you know, because that's probably the direction they're going to go, to be honest. Most I don't likely. I don't really see them going back to turn-based. No. Um, which is, which is unfortunate. Like, I, I'm really excited to see somebody who can evolve the turn-based system for a modern era. Um, that's, I think that's, that's, that's the done. one thing that I actually argue 13 did. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that 13 <laughs> did well. The one thing that the game did do well was that. Mm-hmm. It'll be interesting to see where they go. Mm-hmm. Um, now that they've hit the reset button, um, to see, because I mean, they can do anything now, mm-hmm. um, and it'll be really interesting to see what they do in the future. And it'll be that. ten years yeah. from now. 
Probably. Is that Probably. Okay. Yeah, uh, I think that I think that my gut, I think that my gut feeling is that I would have enjoyed this game even more if it had remained versus. There's something about mm-hmm. like the mainland, the mainline Final Fantasy series that's like sacred to me, mm-hmm. and I don't want to see like it's supposed to fit within a certain. Um, like kind of bubble, see, but, they, um, but they've already had two MMOs that are exactly. Made I kind of ignore those. So they, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> now, they, they've already broken that a while ago. Yeah, exactly. So, um, well, I think that uh, that lets us wrap on the only appropriate note. I've come up with a new recipe. <laughs> oh goodness! <laughs> uh, so thank you everyone for joining us for our roundtable discussion of Final Fantasy 15. Um, I definitely think it's a game worth checking out if it sounds like it might appeal to you. It has its flaws, um, but I, I think it's... I still don't get anime. <laughs> it's, it's, worth, it's worth giving a shot, I think. So, uh, Anyway, I'm Chris. I'm, I'm Doc. I'm Jim. I'm Eric. And we'll see you next time. We want you to write into the show, because dialogue makes everyone better. If you want to comment on this episode, ask a question, share some info, voice an opinion, or request a topic, send an email to inbox at backward-compatible.com, and we may feature you on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward Compatible.